Welcome to X-Plane today and my favorite airplane. Yep, still the 757 is one of my favorite jetliners. Hello, my name is Dave. I do the spy flights over on Twitch and oh, about once a week at this point in time, maybe a little bit, a uh, little bit more soon, <clears throat> more soon, sorry, allergies, more soon here on YouTube. I uh, like to do uh, complete flights here that you can kind of jump into your airplane and fly along and punch the same buttons as you try to learn these increasingly complex simulated airplanes that uh, is available here. So uh, we are at uh, Boston Logan International Airport, where every now and then United will fly a 757 flight down to Washington, Dulles. Unfortunately, my favorite airplane is about to be uh, is uh, slowly on the road to being retired except for uh, some of the uh, cargo carriers right now uh, but right now this is an incredibly cool livery it's a livery based off a real livery uh, that is uh, flying for uh, United uh, this was a uh, part of a special art program that United uh, put together and you can get this livery this is the flight factor 757 the livery is free uh, there is a, a livery painter over at xplane.org named Swinner 74 who painted this livery uh, pretty much for me because they knew that this was one of my favorite airplanes. And uh, Swinner says that to date this is uh, one of the most complex, hardest liveries uh, that he's ever had to do. An awful lot of this was uh, was done uh, done freehand, he said. So one of the things I like about it is they put the uh, cool sunglasses around the cockpit windows right there. So what's the flight plan for today? Well, let's see. We are going to be going uh, from Washington Dulles International Airport. We're going to be using one of the first really great electronic flight bags that was created for Flight Simulator. And we're going to be looking at a little bit more advanced flight planning. Uh, Simbrief, Sim Toolkit Pro, I use those for flight planning. I also use uh, Navigraph charts and data. Uh, we do have a couple of payware airports uh, that I'll be using, and there's ortho scenery pretty much the whole way down to Dulles. And I'm also going to use a very, very old flight planner. Hasn't really been updated in a long time, and it is called TopCat. So part of what we're gonna be doing is looking at some of the numbers that TopCat puts out. Now this has been, you know, I edited a little bit to make it look good on the screen, but these are the kinds of things that the pilots get uh, based on the weather, uh, the load of the airplane to figure out what the perfect speeds are for takeoff and when you uh, start to roll the flaps up and stuff like that. So how can you play along? Well, first of all, fly along with me. This is YouTube, you can hit the pause button. So pause it if you want, pause the, 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 the video, load up your 757, and um, and uh, fly along with me. And by the way, one of the reasons I'm doing this is somebody is making a really nice 757 for Microsoft Flight Simulator. I don't think that the level of depth of uh, operation of that airplane is going to be quite up to the standard set by Flight Factor in this airplane, but I think it's going to be pretty uh, pretty close. So a 757 is coming to Microsoft Flight Simulator soon <laughs> the, the, the developer's favorite word uh one of the cool things about flying along with me here on youtube is you can stop restart and rewind the videos so if i push a button a little bit too fast you can kind of go back and take a look in case you missed something i also suggest that after you do a flight like this with me you go and within a few days try and do the same flight but out of your hometown airport so that you can kind of see the landmarks and uh it just kind of brings it on home a little bit better and then finally if you feel like it uh, you know, hope to join us over on Twitch where we do group flights six days a week uh, at three o'clock Eastern time. That's 1900 Zulu. And uh, here's the flight plan. Boston to Dallas. Uh, Boston right now, real world is departing off runway 22 right. Uh, the real airplanes are flying the Blizzard 5 departure, the hyper rate approach. And yes, this is one of those Sid to Star types of flights because it's only about three, uh, 420 miles. Uh, we're landing at Dallas 19 left. That's what the real world is doing. Our cruise today, flight level 380, and our flight time is an hour and 40 minutes, gate to gate. So uh, there'll probably be a little bit of a pause in the middle of all of this. Uh, just, you know, where I stop the video while we're at cruise, and then we'll restart the video at 100 miles from top of descent so that you'll be able to see every button push. So let's go ahead and hop into uh, the cockpit here. One of the things that the pilots are gonna be doing before the flight time is they go to the pilot office, that secret place that pilots get to go that we never get to see. And they're gonna look at this, the flight plan. This is the flight plan that was generated by Simbrief and Sim Toolkit Pro. I'm using the Lido style of charts now. And all of these numbers gives me, well, sort of a condensed flight plan. 
So if you look over here, and if you look in the description below uh, here on YouTube, you're gonna see that a lot of this information I've gone and cut and pasted. So what you could do is you could copy and paste this into Notepad and start using what I call the flight strip. No, no, we're gonna keep the clothes on and stuff. It's not that kind of strip. And yes, I have a twisted sense of humor, so there you go. But what this is, is this is all the flight data in, and it's in a very, very condensed format. And this is what I use to stay up to date on YouTube, uh, on, uh, on YouTube, on uh, VATSIM flights, really complex VATSIM flights. So this is our route today. It's an hour and 40 minutes. It's got time in, time out, all of that good information uh, that we like to have. And so I've gone and got the flight plan. The next thing that the pilots are gonna do is they're going to assemble what I call the stack of charts. And back in the old days, before we had computers and stuff like that, you had paper charts and you probably would stack up those charts, you know, uh, based on how you need the charts. So the first thing that you probably need is the uh, airport map. And so here, here is our map of the airport. The next thing you'd need is your departure. And there is our departure. One thing to note on the departure is here, 5,000 feet is our top altitude. If you're flying on VATSIM, uh, the uh, VATSIM controllers kind of expect you to look at this chart and determine what your top altitude is if you're cleared on a SID going out of an airport. The star here is the uh, Hyper 8 arrival. And so we're gonna be kind of hyper about this. At Hyper, we're gonna be looking for a transition over here on the left side uh, of the one nine. So we're gonna look to make sure that the flight plan does this transition over here. We're also gonna use the uh, ILS for runway one nine left. It's a little bit more convenient for uh, the Charlie end of the Gulf of the uh, concourse where we'll be parking today. And so we've got that chart set up. We do have the Dulles chart. One line left means we'll probably have to do a little bit of a taxi back, but United basically parks the 757s down at the end of the Charlie Concourse. In fact, we can look at the parking gates and they're all level uh, C Concourse or Charlie. In fact, they usually park them at Charlie 5 and Charlie 6, maybe a couple of threes, but they also park the big wide body jets out down there too. So there we go, this is our flight. There's other things that you can do. You can go to uh, Flight Radar 24, or you could go to uh, FlightAware and take a look at uh, your airline and see where your airline parks. That's how you might know that. And I think you kind of can find that out for almost all worldwide airlines. The other thing that we're gonna be using is a very old flight planner. This thing has not been updated for years, but you can apparently use this with the 737-700. So I haven't gone and set this up. You can see the airplanes that I do have set up right now. So here's a seven here. Well, maybe I did. Yes, here's a 737-700. I totally forgot I'd done that. Okay, well, so yes, you can use this with a 737-700. That is a complex airplane that's available right now in uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. So I haven't done this yet, I wanna do this. But today we're gonna be flying the 752 uh, for uh, United and we're gonna go and look in here and Boston to Dulles, that's already in there. I clicked out so I gotta put my fuel back in. So fuel for today's flight is 18,853. So 18,853 pounds is our total fuel on board. Next thing is taxi fuel. I've got 1,050 pounds of taxi fuel. So 1050. I kicked up the taxi fuel a little bit. I tend to do that mostly for VATSIM events, but now I just do it pretty much all the time. And then our trip fuel is 8,251. So 8,251. All right. So there's all that. Our zero fuel weight for today's flight, that's passengers and baggage, is going to be 165,641. 165,641 gives us all of our information right here. Now you can also, through TopCat, you can go and hit the load sheet button and you can print it out. And this is actually uh, what a load sheet's gonna look like. Uh, that the real uh, 737, 757 pilots are gonna use. But for today, we're gonna go ahead and we can go to the takeoff page. And this is gonna give us some basic information. This, uh, th this is a huge rabbit hole to jump in. So what we're gonna do is skip this and I'm gonna go to the TLR, takeoff and landing report. And we're gonna generate a takeoff report. So we know we're gonna be blasting off on runway 22 right. It's a dry runway, flaps are gonna be autumn, uh, optimum, not uh, optimum. 
I need more coffee. Uh, thrust is going to be set for takeoff. Let's go get the weather. So now I'm going to hit the weather update. And this is going to go out to the internets and get us the current weather. You see that there's a button here that says ACARS. This also works with the Hoppy ACARS system. I don't use an awful lot of that with TopCat right now, but as more people uh, seem to be accepting Hoppy ACARS and stuff, I hope that we're going to start getting some more true to life ACARS things. Okay, so this is all we need. I don't need um, additional runway information because it's just us, so we're not going to be kicked over to another runway. Let's go and do generate. And so if you look, here is going to be a takeoff report for United 441 flight to Boston. And it's generated by TopCat, and here's all of our weight and our weather in pounds. What I care at this point is this takeoff data right here. And usually what I'll do is go grab that data, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to put this in a line right here. And these are my current takeoff numbers based on the current weather. So we're going to be doing flaps 5. That's the optimum flaps for our weight of the airplane. Our V speeds and our flap retraction schedule is all in there. These are all the numbers that the real pilots need to use for this airplane. And we're done. So I'm going to close this. I'm not going to quit out of TopCat. I just move this over to the other monitor. And I'm going to go ahead and minimize it because we might need to revise stuff. Okay. So here we are. I think we're kind of done. And let's see. Uh oh, well, I'm not an expert at parkour. So, and the door's closed. So let's go over here. I'm using a little thing called SAM. And this is something you can get for X Plane. And this will go and this will get Gate Bravo 24. One of the things I'd wish that this developer would have done is an awful lot of the time, United and other airlines that have a mid-cabin door like this, they're going to go and they're going to use this for boarding if possible because uh, the first-class passengers don't like seeing people walk past them. Well, maybe some of the more nasty ones do because they're sort of like, hey, look at me, I've been... Anyway, they, airlines utilize the mid-cabin door. Developers never make that available to us as a boarding door. And there is a way to do it. And all you have to do is do a little check mark. You, and maybe tweak two, two little numbers in your configuration file. And that's all it takes. But they never, of course, do that. And then when I will go inside uh, uh, the configuration file and do it, usually the next time that the airplane is updated, it wipes all that out. So thanks, developers. I don't mean to be mean, but come on, guys. Let's, let's simulate air, airline operations. We have the technology. And if you look, you can also, let's see, let's go over here. I'm going to release the camera. And so let's kind of go down here like this. And let's see, I think I hit shift. Nope, nope, you hit control. There we go. Control is sort of walk slowly. Okay, so control. And if you look, one of the things that the developers did write, just after I did a little uh, beat on the developers, is now that the jetway is attached, it did open our door. So, you know, way to go, developers. Good job. Thank you for, uh, thank you for setting that up. So now that we've gone and done that, we can go in. And I actually have a couple of quick views set up here inside the cabin. So we've got that. But let's go into the best seat in the house. Here it is. And I have always liked this. Uh, this uh, one of the reasons this airplane is a favorite of mine is the way that everything's set up. This is uh, this is the beginning of glass cockpits uh, in aviation, and this one has a combination of glass, so computers, and what we call steam gauges, the old school gauges in there. And in fact, uh, you can do uh, VORs and ADFs and DMEs with this airplane, and you can set and use your old school gauges, but you can also use the uh, newer flight management computers or newer flight management computers at the time. And so that, that, that's one of the reasons why I like this, uh, this airplane is because it's the best of both worlds. The other re uh, there are a lot of other reasons. One of the things about this airplane that's particularly cool is this. This is one of the very first electronic flight bags or iPads that was ever made for a flight simulator airplane. Okay, somebody might have done another one, but this one was the one that caught my attention a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And it really is kind of good. Uh, now, there are flight ba electronic flight bag bags that are being made uh, current uh, right now. Uh, the Phoenix A320 Ameri uh, electronic flight bag over in Microsoft Flight Simulator is absolutely the best flight bag I've ever seen in a simulator. 
So, you know, hats off to Phoenix for that. That was really amazing. Let's go to operations. We're going to go to ground. And uh, let's see, we've got a landing U, uh, LSU cargo. Chocks are in place. A ground power unit is plugged in. We're in gate config. And we've got an air conditioning unit plugged in. I'm also going to order a fuel truck. Now then, passengers. So go to your flight plan. Our passengers today off the flight plan are... 140 passengers. So we're going to go over here and go 140. That's all it takes. There's our passengers. And we have 900, only 900 pounds of cargo today. So not a lot of cargo. And that gives us a zero fuel weight right now. It says 161, 174. The computer said 165. So maybe I'm misreading. Let's put in 9,000 pounds. Did I misread that? That's 169, so it's not that. So these numbers are gonna be off just a little bit, but we can kind of make them close. Let's try 1250 of cargo. Okay, that looks pretty good. That's a little bit closer to our uh, 165. Now the next thing that I'm gonna do is you see a lot of the first class uh, seats are empty. So I'm gonna optimize this just a bit, but I'm gonna move uh, passengers forward until we occupy all of the first class seats. And the reason that I'm doing that is the airlines are going to do that. They don't like to leave a first class seat empty, especially if they can kick, you know, some guy like me that has a few flight miles up there to make me feel good. But there you go. All of this is done. Now our airplane's loaded. Fuel for today's flight is going to be 18,853. So 18,853. And there's our fuel. Okay, so this is looking pretty good. The uh, Flight Factor 757, one thing to do, always hit the maintenance button. This is going to go and uh, pump up the tires and top off the oil and top off the hydraulic fluid. These are things that will run out uh, even if you have failures turned off on this airplane. So all of this is good. Let's go to the operations page. We've already got the uh, uh, left front door open uh, in the airlines. They call this the 1L door. We're also going to open forward and aft cargo and get those open too. And if we come out here and zoom into the airplane, you can see that we've got our loaders set up and the cargo set up and we're all ready to go and start doing airplane stuff. So let's see, what are we here? 17 minutes into the video and now it's time to turn power on the airplane. And here in this airplane, the on switch is right over here. Battery and then you guard it again. So you put a little guard over it so you don't turn it off in flight. Now we're gonna go and do standby power and we're gonna come down here. Do you hear the beep, beep, beep? One of the things that Flight Factor did is they included the Flight Factor flight attendant, who's probably one of the most irritating flight attendants in flight simulation. There are several things you can do. You can push the flight attendant call button 17 times and that kills the flight attendant. Uh, I'm only usually that homicidal late in the day. So the other thing I do is just ignore him. And then uh, on pushback, we go and we'll start the, um, we'll start uh, letting him do his passenger announcement and then he will shut up. So there you go. Let's say uh, external power. We've got the ground power cart plugged in. So we're going to turn on external power. Bus ties can go on. And we're going to come down here and do the utility buses. And we're gonna keep going down here and we're gonna do the position lights. And look at that, we got uh, the airplane slowly coming to life here. There's something I'm a little bit uh, rusty with here. So one of the things that we get on this airplane in the electronic flight bag is checklists. So let's see here, this is our pre-flight. I'm trying to remember, I think Amplified tells me Electrical power, bus ties, it's established. APU generator. Uh, so it wants the APUs. Yeah, skip this one for now. Okay, let's go to the next page. There is a hydraulic system that we turn on. And I'm trying to remember which one. That's IDENT. Hydraulic panel. Okay, it's the left and right engine pumps that we want to turn on. I've, uh, it's been a while, so left and right engine pumps go on right now. Now well, that doesn't make sense. I would have thought it would have been the electricals. Well, maybe, okay, the, okay, these are going on, so maybe it's the electrics that go on first. 
This is something that I've forgotten. It's been a long time. I think one of the, we could probably even turn on the uh, uh, the center hydraulics too. Let's just go on there and hope we don't burn anything out. But what, there's a couple of those switches that go on at this point. The other thing we can do is we can turn up the lights in the cabin. We could add a little bit of dome lighting here. And then I also usually will go and turn some of these, uh, some of these lights up too. Let's also go ahead and do the panel lights. This is backlighting on the panels, just makes it easier to see uh, the instruments in the panels. And our 757 cockpit is coming to life. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is let's go down and have a look at the FMC stuff. This is a little primitive compared to uh, some of the other airplanes that are out there right now. But we're gonna look at the IDENT page and July through August, so the data is good. Now then, let's go up here and we're gonna turn on, and apparently it's just nav one, nav two, nav three. Go straight up to nav. And so uh, these, there is an align button. I think you use the align button if you want to put your, um, if you want to put your, um, uh, let's see, display, I don't think we have that. If you wanted to go and have, um, if you put in your uh, latitude and longitude, um, manually but it's been a long time since i've done that with that in place let's give it a reference airport we are k b o s bast and logan and then you take a look at your gps position is it relatively close to this one now this has given us our exact position i don't know if our gate number works gate numbers don't work that much in flight sim but if these two numbers are close get the gps and put it in there and we are aligning so there we go. Now then, there is a thing that you can do with this airplane, and that is you can download the flight plan directly into the airplane. Uh, we've got a very simple flight plan, so I thought what I'd do today is just enter it in without doing the downloader, because to be honest, uh, you know, the downloader is great. I mean, I use it especially for longer flights, but you kind of forget how to put in a flight plan. So. Boston goes for our origin. Our destination is KIAD, Washington, Dallas. Okay, our flight number is UA, flight 441. And we're not gonna put in the company route this time, but we're gonna go to the next page and our only waypoint is BAF. So B-A-F to V-O-R, that's it. Okay, you hear the beep? That's the annoying flight attendant. Just ignore him. There was a while, it was a while it really drove me nuts, but that's it. So now we're gonna go and do activate and execute. Next thing, let's go to departure and arrival. We uh, already know in the real world that uh, Boston is on the two twos for departure. How do we do this? I look at digital ATIS. This is real world data that's available for the US. If you're not in the US, you can go to flight radar 24 or uh, FlightAware and just look at the airplanes in the little map. You can also get an ATIS too. So here's Boston, let's hit refresh. It is information whiskey, that is current. And ILS 22 left is the arrival, departing on 22 right. There we go, that's how we know that. And you can see I also have Dulles over here too. So two great little things, to link in the description for uh, digital ATIS. So 22 left, we're gonna be on the Blizzard 5 departure and execute that. Come on back in. We're gonna come over to the arrivals and we know that we're gonna be arriving on one nine left. We are doing the hyper eight arrival and it's via BAF. And I believe the transition is Martinburg. This is why you assemble your charts. So coming on in here, there's uh, Daddy Asper and Martinsburg, where does Hyper 8 leave us? It leaves us at Daddy. So do we get to go via Daddy? We sure do. And execute that. There's our legs, so this is looking good. Let's go on up here and it's APU time so that we can start to get uh, some uh, ventilation here in the airplane. And we need to get the uh, passengers rolling down the, uh, down the jetway and stuff loading. So we're gonna go over here and get some trim air on. I forgot to do that because I jumped down another rabbit hole. 
While this is going on, let's also go down here and I'm going to turn the engine display up and all of that's looking good. Now, while the APU is coming up, we'll look here, next page. Uh, after Blizzard, we want to go direct to Bath and execute that. York, Jets, LRP, Lurch, Oogle, Ogle. There's our daddy. That's okay. I got to stop that right now. And there's our runway. The legs are good. So all of that's great. And you just heard the click. That's going to be the APU is up and running. Let's get the bleed turned on, isolation switch, and packs on so that we can make the uh, airplane comfy for the passengers. And now that it's comfy for the passengers, we're ready to go. Go to operations, go to ground, and load. Airplanes, passengers walking down the jetway. So all of that is good to go. Now that we've done that, go back to the root page and everything's looking good. Let's go to the uh, performance init. And this is where we're gonna put a little bit of information from the flight plan, including our cruise altitude, and that's flight level 380. So 380, 38,000 feet. The flight plan says our cost index today is 75. So we're not gonna be going super slow. Our reserve fuel is going to be 7.79. 7.79 so when we land we need to have 7,790 pounds of fuel and that that basically is telling us that um, 700 that's uh, uh, holding time diversion time and a little bit and 15 minutes of extra time so that way we've got enough fuel to be legal to to to, to do the flight I didn't do a very good job of explaining that it's, uh, and part of, partly it's because I saw insufficient fuel. This thing is gonna pop up on us every now and then. Don't worry about it until you get to cruise. You know, tr we're gonna trust the math right now. All right, so all of this is coming together. Let's go ahead and the ADA says the altimeter here in uh, Boston is 2998. So come on over here and 2998. Now there's a little secret here to the Flight Factor airplane. And that is the screw. All right, so over here, there's our altimeter. So watch my little pointer here. You see it over here? Watch as I move it over the upper left screw. See the little arrow? I just set the first officer's altimeter. So that's just a little way to, uh, to save yourself some time. And 2992 on the backup. Two, no, 2998 on the backup. There was a, there's a live streamer, flight simmer that we, I drove, I drove this person absolutely nuts because I usually just did not do that. And so like, come on, set your backup altimeter, be a real pilot here. Okay, coming on over here, our departure heading, we set the departure heading in and looking at the chart. So this is why you set up your charts in advance. So it's right there. Our heading is gonna be 215 off the runway. So dial in 215 degrees. 215 I really like do you notice the way the way the uh, numbers are kind of bouncing in here that's the way that it happened in this airplane so watch I'll do it again see how it bounces that was actually really pretty cool about this old airplane we already know because we read uh, the uh, departure that over here on the departure our top altitude our cleared altitude is going to be 5,000 feet so we'll slide over here and we're gonna dial down to 5,000 feet. The click zones on this airplane are incredibly well done. There's a lot of click zones that are not well done on this airplane, and this is one of the airplanes that it's well done on. Okay, let's go ahead and get our electronic flight bag. We're gonna go to uh, ground, and we do have uh, the APU running, so I'm gonna disconnect the uh, air conditioning unit right now. And if we look up here, let's check the fuel, 18.8. Look at your flight plan, we're done fueling. And if you've noticed the, uh, the noise has changed, we're done loading the airplane. It's time to start thinking about going. Let's see here, everything looks pretty good. I think we're still aligning. I hope we're still aligning, otherwise I'm gonna be really embarrassed. So let's go back to the menu, FMC, 
index position in it are we doing i think we're i think we're doing our knit so we are in knitting as best we can i think we're getting the knitting taken care of here so now then that we've got all of this taken care of we can go and uh, take a look at the uh, ipad so let's get the ipad up here and we're going to come over here to operations and ground and now let's go back down to the fmc our zero fuel weight, the actual zero fuel weight of the airplane is 161.5. 161.5. Pop that in there. That's also going to do your gross rate. It's going to yell at you about fuel. I'm not going to, let's not worry about that. And now we're also done with fueling. So that's good news. Uh, we can come up here and we can disconnect ground power. So the APU is uh, providing electricity. Let's uh, put the APU online and we're going to do external power off and disconnect the ground power unit. Okay, we also can get rid of the loaders. So the loaders are gone and chocks and gate config remain in place. So airplanes kind of coming together here. Let's go ahead and in uh, X plane, the gold standard for pushback is better pushback. We're going to start that right hey, Captain, now. Let me know where you want this thing. Ah, the voice of our pushback driver is uh, a former uh, Twitch streamer named Cat Strader, and that is how I learned about. Great news, Captain! Your toes coming. That's how I learned about uh, Twitch and live streaming and aviation on the internet like this. So uh, that that you know that that's the person who you could blame if you need to blame for all of this. Next thing that I'm going to do is come over to the FMC and I'm going to go ahead and put progress over here. Again, you can see at Dulles it says we're going to have 1.7, 1,700. We're supposed to have uh, 7,000. This is why the FMC is yelling at us right now. Okay, so everything's looking good here. I say no smoking and let's do seatbelts going on too. All of this is looking good. Uh, let's close the doors. It's time to get ready to go. So operations and airplane, and we're going to close the cargo bays, and the ground crew All is already right. brought. Looks like the doors and hatches are closed, and we're ready to connect. The uh, ground crew is ready to um, uh, is has come in and handed us the final load sheet. Let's go ahead and close that left front door. Go to ground, and we're good to go there. We're also going to go ahead and start getting ready for our checklist. I'm going to get the beacon on here. So now that we got the beacon on and with the door closed, I'm going to arm the emergency exit lights and guard the emergency exit lights. So that's looking good too. This airplane, as I mentioned, has some really good checklists. So the normal checklist is what I like to go to here. So uh, oxygen. So here is our oxygen. And you can zoom down Welcome here. Welcome aboard, Captain. Toes connected, bypass pens inserted. Go ahead and kill the parking brake when you're ready to go. Okay, we will. Thank you. Hit the uh, test button. There's our test. And we just did the oxygen test. Pressurization. So pressurization, first of all, go over to your charts. Look at the arrival airport here at Dulles. Look in the upper left-hand corner. It's the same, same way for Lido charts. 313 feet is the airport altitude. That is our landing elevation. So that's going to be 310. So dial this down to 310. And then turn this over to auto. Pretty good. Flight instruments. I think our flight instruments are probably pretty good at the moment. There's tests that you can run. You could do cancel and recall. There's a number of tests that you can do. Let's just go ahead and say we're done with those tests. It, uh, parking brakes good. Fuel control switches are uh, cut off and our gear pins are aboard the airplane. Come on over here. Fuel has been checked. Passenger signs are on. Windows. So you can't open the windows. Are they closed? Yep. Mode control panel. Yeah, I think that's pretty much set. Although I guess we could turn on our flight directors. So we get that system up and running. So mode control panel is good. Takeoff thrust. I think our takeoff thrusts are all set in here too. So that's been preset while we put all of that information in. Speeds are good. CDU, rudder and aileron trim is zero. Taxi and takeoff briefing. This whole video is a briefing. Flight deck door is closed. Red anti-collision light before start checks are good. We're now ready for push and start. 
One of the things that the SAM scenery developers ought to do is you notice that little tab here on the side is gone. The jetway is in place. So we got to get rid of the jetway. So one of the things you have to do, which kind of destroys the immersion, is you have to go and get to SAM and get the window back up again. And then you have to click this to get rid of the jetway. Well, now it's behaving funny. Now I'll put the jetway in place. Maybe it closed the jetway when I closed my door. Oh, there it goes. Did it? Okay, it's going away. So the, I did get rid of the jetway. And then, and then the little blue uh, M shows up there in the corner again. So that's a little, uh, little uh, logic problem that's kind of messed up there. Okay, jetway is clear. So now we can come on down here. Parking brake we already know is on, so go to ground. And all we're gonna do is get rid of the chalks. And we're good to go there. And at this point in time, if we were on VATSIM, we would be coming down to our transponder and we would be squawking uh, uh, mode Charlie. And to do mode Charlie, which is uh, 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 position and radar, you just go to TARA right now. Real airplanes are going to stop. They're going to go uh, altitude off to start. But I think in this airplane, you do need to start squawking uh, TARA to show up. Um, to show up on the radar scopes uh, for VATSIM. And we're ready to go. So come on down here. There's our parking brakes. Parking brakes off. Here comes Out the pushback. Light them up. All right. And if you take a look at my flight plan, we are four minutes late out of the gate. It's not too bad. Not too bad considering all the little rabbit holes that I had us jump down here. We can go and start engines now. So pack's going to go off. So if you're a passenger in an airplane, you probably notice as they're pushing back, the, uh, uh, the AC seems to go off. That's so that they can start engines. Starter goes to both. Well, let's start engine number two first. Engine number two, click it over to ground start. Look down here, is the N2 going up? Sure is. 13, 14, 15, and I think it's 22%. And... I think you can use the Airbus switches on this airplane. Yep, there goes fuel control. And here comes our very big. Now, uh, I did destroy the immersion for you a little bit here. United does fly this 757 with this livery, but it's a former Continental 757, which means it's got uh, the Rolls-Royce engines and I'm flying the Pratt & Whitney's. So I just think the Pratt & Whitney's look a little bit better on an airplane like this. The Rolls-Royce are good engines. They're sleek looking. They just, you know, uh, the, the, the Pratt & Whitney's just look better on this airplane. And it looks like we got a good start on this engine. It's stable. So now that that engine's stable, we're gonna go ahead, ground start for engine number one. And two is going up. And our pushback is going along fairly nicely. You can look back here in the uh, cabin, look out the door. There's an awful lot of, one of the things about X-Plane 11 is it looks kind of dingy. It looks gray. And Microsoft Flight Simulator's colors look so much more vibrant than this. You can go and make and get some shaders and things and fix all that. Oops, start the engine. Uh, you can get shaders and stuff. I haven't gone and done the shaders. It's annoying, but I don't do anything with them. Just about done here. Go ahead and set your parking brake. I would just assume that we not have to go and do a bunch of, you know, artificial shaders like that. It would be and nice. And we're disconnecting the tow. Give me just a moment. Okay, there's our parking brakes. That engine is started. We got two good starts on our engines. And as uh, engine number one stabilizes, at about 22% N1, we're gonna go up here and get the packs back on to keep the passengers comfy, and we're gonna get the engine bleeds on and turn off the isolation switch. Okay, let's also go over here and we're gonna put the engine generators on. You probably notice that in airplanes, the, the, the lights dipping and a big click, that's generator switches. And with generator switches and all that done, we're done with the APU. Let's also turn on the window windshield heaters. Those need to go on too. And everything else is looking good. And we're disconnected. Signal and pen on the left. Take it easy and have a safe flight. All right, thank you for the nice push. Okay, let's go ahead and do that checklist. 
Anti-ice is not needed. Isolation switch is off. Now it wants us to go down here. And this is the cancel and recall button. So cancel clears everything. Recall shows you what's wrong. And the recall has been checked. Nothing's wrong. Auto brakes to RTO. Ground equipment is clear. And uh, taxi, runway turn off light switches are going to go on. They really want you to turn on the uh, turn off lights, the runway turn off lights here. The thing is on this airplane, they're kind of hard to get to. They're kind of hard to click and turn on and off. So, and also the taxi light, the nose gear. And we're ready for taxi. So like I was saying, this electronic checklist is really good. It's one of the first ones ever. And looking out there, everything's clear of the airplane. I think it's time to go. Sit back, make sure, you, does your chair tilt back? Lock your chair in if you got rudder pedals. It just makes your life so much easier. Look down here, toe brakes are on. And, that, and when you do your toe brakes, like 737, that releases your parking brake. Hand on the throttle, hand on the nose wheels tiller. When you release the brakes, you will start moving forward. And out we go. There is our big 757-200. I think the 200 is a little more fun to fly. I have not advanced my throttles or anything like that yet. Now then, at this point in time, come on down here, go to in-flight, go to PA, and do safety demonstration. Ladies and gentlemen. We that will, uh, otherwise the flight attendant will bug you for the entire freaking flight. Again, you can kill the flight attendant if you want to. Uh, I haven't had enough coffee to be that homicidal yet. We're going to come down here. I'm going to go ahead and put the map on. And we're going to go ahead and make the range a little bit more. Uh, a little bit bigger. A little bit more. I'm going to widen the range of the map. Sounds better. So we've got that. Actually, this is kind of a tight departure. Let's leave it on 10 miles. I'm also going to preload airports and data. Or, or load that in right now. This airplane will taxi you like this at about... Our ground speed at the moment is six knots. So here in the gate area, you probably notice that you taxi at about 10 knots. Uh, for a long straightaway taxi, like at Denver, maybe up to 20 at some point in time. But you know, as you look out the window, I mean, that kind of looks a little bit like a taxi out in the gate area. But we could add just a little bit of thrust here and get that up to about 10 to 15 knots in this general area. Okay, uh, let's see. Performance is looking good. It will yell at us about that. We haven't done these numbers yet, so flaps are going to be five. Thrust. Thrust setting is going to be 59 degrees. Center of gravity. Oh, God, where are we going to get that? Electronic flight bag time, operations, ground, center of gravity is 16%. So, 16. Now, if you don't have Topcat, at this point in time, you can turn on the reference speeds, and the airplane will give you pretty good reference speeds. I've decided to jump down the Topcat rabbit hole, so 136. Only when leaving the aircraft. Rotate at 139. And V2 is 141. Your seat bottom cushion can be used as a and we're all set and ready to go there. This airplane will also preset your bugs when you do that sort of thing. So, 136. Yeah, there you go. Now, this airplane also tra uh, tracks these pretty stably, so I'm able to go and do those sorts of things. Stably? Is that a word? The airplane travel, uh, tag, uh, the taxi characteristics of this airplane are quite stable. Clearly, I need more coffee today. Thanks for putting up with me. Flaps. Two clicks. Flaps five. Okay, let's add a little bit more. We're going a little bit slow at this point. As we're getting out of the gate area now. We strongly suggest you read it before takeoff. If you have any questions. 
always just thought that this is one of the best looking jetliners out there too. Just a really good jetliner. One of the other things about this airplane is this airplane was designed to bring a bigger load than a 737 into a high altitude airport and fly a greater distance. So they kind of beefed up the uh, performance on this airplane. And one of the things I've heard said about the 757 is it has one of the highest weight to power ratios of any of the jetliners. Which means if James Bond is running down the jet, running down an airport concourse and needs to get away from the bad guys and needs to steal a jet, this is the one that James needs to steal if the little BD-5J that he flew through the hangar isn't available. So this is, the, this is a good one for James to steal because it's, it's, it's more of a sports car. You know, call this one the Aston Martin DB5 of the jetliners. Okay, we're coming up on Charlie 5. You saw the painted triangle on the ground. We're gonna go over to the November taxiway. And for 2-2, this is the way we go. We're probably cleared across. So we're cleared across this runway, as we almost always are. If you're on VATSIM and you know they're doing uh, departing on the 2-2s, you're always cleared across 1-5 right, which is here, but they always want you to stop at 1-5 left, which is usually when they hand you over to tower. All right, last few steps. I'm gonna turn on my auto throttles. Those are good. We're gonna go in ARM, LNAV, and VNAV. Those things are ready to go too. Now you've probably noticed I've also kicked up my uh, throttles a little bit. We're starting to pick up some speed here. Now we're taxiing good 13 knots. Looking out the window, then this look like it, what it looks like outside your window if you're a passenger. So yeah, this is about, uh, this is uh, gonna be real world taxi speed. And we don't wanna go too fast. So I'm gonna roll my throttles down just a bit. Yeah, about 17 knots now. So this is where uh, ground at Boston on VATSIM is usually gonna have you stop and then they'll kick you over to tower uh, as we come up, uh, as we cross uh, uh, one five right left. Okay, speed 16, now it's diminishing a little bit, which is good because we got a 90 degree turn to do up here. And you wanna take those 90 degree turns at about 10 knots as we make our right turn over to the runway. So you can see here we are crossing one five left and there's that 90 degree turn at November one. Over here, you might notice that the uh, pavement changes to uh, concrete as opposed to asphalt on a hot day. You got a big heavy jet sitting out here waiting to take off. If it's getting hotter and hotter, the concrete is gonna handle the heavy jet better than the uh, asphalt will. So I think that, and, and they probably have to replace this a lot more. So this is why it is that we've got uh, this concrete pad. This is where you wait for your turn to take off. And let's come on over here. Checklist before takeoff. Takeoff briefing has been done ad nauseum. Packs, auto and off. So I guess we're gonna be good for packs. Flaps, stabilizer tram. Uh-oh, we didn't set the stabilizer tram. And so we can come down here to the FMC. Let's, let's taxi first. Let's do our taxi first and then we can do that. And we'll stop and, and do that. One of the things on a VAT sim is people get a little bit rushed. And there are definitely some times in the world of VAT sim where yes, you need to do something and you need to do it now. But 90% of the time, you don't need to rush as much. We'll almost always have a few seconds to sit here at this point and, and, and do these numbers. So you'll also have a few seconds to look ahead and see, okay, what's departure frequency? And maybe we can preset that. And holding short, there we go. Come on down here, parking brakes. Look down here. Okay, so let's do trim 5.1. So look down here, where are we? So there is four. There's five and one. Trim is set up. Flight controls. 
Uh, flight controls are looking good. If you want, you can come and hit the status button. And you look down here in the lower corner, there's elevators, there's ailerons. Now, I think that these are moving way too fast. I think I need to turn the sensitivities down on this airplane. Okay, flight controls, the cabin is good. And now it wants us to turn the um, uh, turn off lights off. And those are hard to get at. Before takeoff checklists are done, next thing is after takeoff checks. I think we're ready to go. So here we go, out to the runway. Next thing, we're gonna do uh, white strobe lights. Parking brakes are off and out we go. It's almost flying time. At this point in time, in my world of flight simming, I usually at this point, I turn off the moving map here. At this point, if you're new, Go ahead and shift it on over so that you can follow your departure. Nothing wrong with having a moving map like that. I tend to want to look at the moving maps here. So that's why I look at the moving maps here and that's, that's why I might turn off my flight tracking uh, over, on, uh, over on something like Navigraph. All right, everything looks good here. We're gonna go back with engines, around we go. Strobes are on. The last thing we'll do is turn on the landing lights. The landing lights are a lot more powerful. And so you wait till you're pointed down the runway so you don't blind somebody, uh, which you could do. This also sends a signal to the tower and everybody, hey, I'm serious about doing that flying thing. All right, so everything's looking good here. Throttles, I'm gonna run these up. To that little spot right there and then I'm going to hit the thrust button and that should be good I hope if you're using the Airbus throttles that's going to be the first detent pretty much airspeeds alive 80 knots we are, we're doing a D right, so we're going to use using most of the real estate down here, you get most of the runway. I would really like more developers to include airspeed callouts for takeoff. V1, rotate, gentle pull up on the stick here. You can drag the tail on these airplanes. And we are up, up and away. Follow your flight directors. Landing gear, and it should go up and off. Follow the flight director, time for the turn. We're climbing a little steeply. No autopilot yet, there's a gentle turn. Still climbing a little steeply here as we do our turn out. At this point in time, the tower is gonna say, go over to departure. So this is why you wanna have your departure frequency set. I'm still climbing too steeply. Okay, there we go, that's centered. Let's go ahead and get a little help from the autopilot now. AP. And there's 5,000 feet. Uh-oh, we're going down. I must have been climbing too fast. Let's see, is it gonna put me into the ground? Yeah, I didn't manage my departure, my climb out very good. 1,000. Okay, you're gonna start going up there, airplane? Good, now it's going up. So I didn't do a very good job of doing that. It wants a little more airspeed. And we're looking good there. I usually try and keep the heading bug pointed forward. Let's see, we could have also come down here and this airplane has terrain radar. So one person, uh, one pilot's gonna have terrain radar, the other will have um, uh, weather radar. And there's our turn at TJ. And at this point, uh, ATC is gonna say climb and maintain probably 17,000. So climb, maintain 17,000. Uh, let's see, we've stopped. Is it because I've been competent or no, above 3,000 feet at Burrow. 
I may... Oh, VNAV is off. Gee, I, 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 I did I turn on VNAV? I probably did something wrong. In my case, chances are the airplane is smarter than I am. Okay, we got a good little speed up going here. You gonna pick up that climb? There we go, now I think we're starting our climb again. So I let the airplane get a little slow and, I, and VNAV got popped off. Generally, one of the hardest things that I'm dealing with in flight sim right now is there are so many airplanes. And the thing is, is with so many airplanes, they're also getting more and more complex. It's been months since I've flown this airplane. We uh, did it on live stream the other day, but you know, remembering, okay, it works this way in the Airbus, that way in the McDonnell Douglas, this way in the Boeing, keeping all of that straight, wow. So I probably missed a few button pushes. One of the reasons though that I will leave uh, the uh, mistakes like this in a video like this is to show, guess what? We're still flying. We're still pretty much in our place in the sky. And so if you're having a problem like this, you can uh, recover and keep flying in VATSIM. Uh, let's see, one of the things I also forgot to do, we should have been doing a notch of flaps, flaps one. There goes flaps one. And speed's now coming up a little bit. I also left them out a little bit because we had a couple of speed restrictions here. So, and now we can go flaps up. And starting our turn, nice view of the water. And nice view of our airplane. It's another dull day in X-Plane. I really hope that X-Plane 12 is not as dull. And I hope that if, if you know, because I don't want to have to do a lot of reshaders. Remember we had auto brakes set, this airplane automatically, after you take off, turns off the auto brakes for you. So this is the beginning of some more of the advanced automation uh, in, in, in modern jetliners, which is really cool. And here's our next turn. Let's come on down here and widen out the map. I also forgot to turn on traffic. So if we were on VATSIM, uh, we would uh, be seeing traffic. Continuing our climb, doing pretty good. There's 5,000 feet. falling behind on keeping my heading bug updated. You know, if the autopilot fails setting your heading bug like that, it's really nice to be able to see uh, what direction you're supposed to be flying. So here we go. You see, we got this little clear spat, clear, clear patch in the clouds. So my whining about how dull things are, see how bright it is there? Airplane's bright, it's bright there, but everything else is dull. I think what they're trying to do is make it more accurate when you're in the sun like this. The problem is, I think they just went overboard on the dull. And so that's why, you know, this thing is, is considered, you know, the gray sim. Uh, as far as weather, one of the things that I am using, as I forgot to mention, I do have a payware weather app. I'm using Active Sky. I'm using Active Sky. In X-Plane, there is another weather app that you can use, and it's called X-Enviro. I'm actually really, really impressed with X-Enviro because X-Enviro does something that I call weather blending. And so you'll notice as we fly along, the clouds are gonna flash off and flash on. That's when we get a new weather update or we do enter a new weather area or something, and it's very abrupt. You'll see your airplane will shake, sometimes violently when the weather changes, when we go into a new weather area. X and Viro will blend the weather together. And I really wish, and, and I think that, I don't use X and Viro because it's a little bit heavy on my frame rate. It's too heavy for my older system. So, but weather blending like that, I'm sure that that's a very, very tall order in the world of simulators, but I really wish we had more of that. Okay, there's 10,000 feet landing lights can go off. We're also going to ring the bell, let the cabin crew know we're past 10,000 feet for most airlines, that's past sterile cockpit. So if the flight crew needs to call the cockpit, they can now. 
for passengers, you probably notice that they will do an announcement at, at 10,000 feet or thereabouts after takeoff. And uh, they will basically say, the seatbelt sign is still on. No, you can't go to the bathroom. Why don't you apply for our great credit card deal? Okay, so we're good to go there. Gears up, flaps up. I think it's time for another checklist. Gear is up, flaps up. Look at that. It automatically told me we've done that. We're still waiting for the altimeters at 18,000 feet. That really was, back in the day, just an absolutely amazing electronic. It was one of the first electric follow-along checklists, I think, in flight simulation. Now, I, I mean, we've got great checklists. The FlyJ Sim Q400 is awesome. Uh, the checklist that we have over in... Um, the Phoenix A320 and that whole electronic flight bag, like I've said, continues to just knock my socks off at how awesome it is uh, and how close to what the real world pilots do because it was coded by a real world pilot who knows these things, who actually sat in that chair in a real airplane. So I, you know, I'm really impressed with what Phoenix has put out uh, as far as the sim. And PMDG is about ready to put out their own electronic flight bag. I have no idea what to expect, but I suspect it's going to be really good, and I can't wait for that one. Okay, we're doing pretty good. There's our departure. Uh, we just got a phone call from ATC. We are going to climb and maintain flight level 380. So continue the climb, 38,000 feet. We've probably been uh, about ready to get kicked over to center. If you're on VATSIM, you know that center, uh, and there is a really great uh, uh, Twitch streamer named Sheedy, does a lot of ATC, does marathon ATC sessions and puts them up on, on Twitch for you to see. It's really good. Uh, it's great one, for one thing. First of all, it's uh, for flight simmers. You get to see what it looks like over on the other side. You get to see what it looks like uh, from the ATC side. And I think that that's, A, it's cool to get to see if you're an aviation nerd, but B, you get to see, okay, this is what it looks like to them. So there we go. Passing 14,000 feet, we are 370 miles north of Dulles, 90 miles to top of climb. We should have 14.9, 14,900 pounds of fuel in the tanks when we get to Dulles. Notice how the uh, comp the airplane stopped whining at us about insufficient fuel. So that's how I, that's why it is that all of those things uh, work worked out. When I first started flying the airplane and insufficient fuel popped up, it's like, oh, I screwed up. I don't know what I'm doing. And so I would load these massive amounts of fuel, you know, and then, you know, when I would land, I would have so much fuel. And a few times I was overweight because I was putting so much extra fuel in there. Well, no, it turned out we had enough fuel. Life was good. So don't panic on that one. Coming up on Blizzard. Blizzard is the end of the star. So everything's looking good. We're coming past a couple of airports. Does look like it's going to be one of those kinds of cloudy days here on the East Coast. So, too bad because, you know, looking through the clouds and looking down, you'll see what ortho scenery looks like in X-Plane. And it isn't going, it doesn't look like Microsoft Flight Simulator, but I've got to tell you, you put some ortho out there and you really can make this sim look good. I'm really excited to see what, how the sim looks uh, when X-Plane 12 comes out. I know that uh, X-Plane is extremely... Uh, excited about their uh, propeller physics and I think that's awesome but visual experience is important in aviation too and wow does that airplane just look good just an amazing experience just an amazing airplane 289, okay, we passed 18,000 feet. We should have done the altimeters. So altimeters, gotta come over here and Barrow, 2992. Don't forget to click the screw for the uh, first officer. If you don't, the airplane will eventually yell at you. So let's just leave it and see how long it takes to say, hey, there is an inconsistency between the two. 
much. Maybe there isn't enough space. So we didn't set, did the first officer get reset when I did that? Nope, that's 2998. Let's see if, it, if that's a big enough difference between the altimeters. It should pop up there maybe. Maybe that's not big enough, I don't know. Now in the, uh, in the Phoenix A320, you've got to have them either synced up or you've got to reset them. And I think you've got about 30 seconds in the Phoenix A320 to set both uh, the pilot and the co-pilot altimeters before it has a problem with you. It could be that this isn't big enough. Twenty-three thousand feet. Maybe it's not big enough. So we need a bigger, bigger thing for us to get a uh, a, uh, a bigger difference in altitudes for it to yell. So let's just go ahead and hit the screw, and let's go on down here. We'll set the backup because we want to be good pilots. Two nine nine two. Come on down here. Grab our checklist, and altimeters are set. After takeoff checklist is done. Next checklist is descent. Let's go ahead and it's nice and smooth. I'm going to ring the bell again and let the flight attendants know that they can get up. Another little view between through the clouds so you see a really nice little bright area down there and the shadows over there. It's just too much. But looking out the window, not so bad from this altitude. Not a very bad view at all. You can come up here and you can do the uh, flight deck door to unlocked. And you can come over here and you can walk this way and you can open the door. There's a lot of, uh, some developers kind of think that this is, you know, what I think they call it, a, a, you know, a ding dong thing. This is kind of part of the flight sim experience, you know. A lot of us don't get to spend uh, time in airplanes. And so being able to come and explore the airplane is a nice thing to do. Just got to make sure that the coffee pot is warm. This is uh, an older first class cabin. Uh, United did go and uh, put the Polaris stuff up here uh, because they'll use these on some uh, cross the pond flights. Got a couple of bathrooms back here. And listen as we go over the wing here. This is one of the first airplanes where the engine sounds would change like that as you go further, further, further back in the airplane. So this, uh, this one uh, at Flight Factor really, really did cool stuff with this airplane. And it's still, I think it holds up really well today. Now, if you're gonna go and go zip it around the airplane like I'm doing here, see my little pointer here? So watch as I move it up the aisle. Uh-oh, did you see how it changed to a knob? You can control knobs of your cockpit all the way back here. So as you're walking around the airplane and you're gonna wanna move over here and move over there, one of the things to do is not click anywhere around the cockpit or else you will turn some of your switches on and off, including the switch that says, you know, crash the airplane. So you don't wanna do that. Uh, one thing on this airplane, so you see over here uh, that you step down. Okay, as we come on in here, so if you were in the 767, you would actually step up because it's pretty much they use the same cockpit. And part of the reason that they did that was so that an airline pilot could be type rated in both this airplane and the 767. Uh, and not have to go through a ton of extra retraining and everything else. So it was very easy. It gave uh, pilots and airlines a little more flexibility there. You know, and uh, they were able to save training money and a bunch of other stuff. So by using the same cockpit, but because the 767 is a wider body, so they had to move it up and this one down. 
a little bit in the actual grand scheme of things. Passing 29,000 feet, we're doing an early morning flight. It's smooth outside. I'm gonna go ahead and do seat belts off. It's smooth. There's somebody back there that got the venti instead of the grande. We're gonna, we're, we are going to show mercy. By the way, yes, that happened to me, but it only happened once. I learned my lesson. And out we go, approaching our final cruising altitude. We are 100, we're 310 miles uh, north of Washington, Dulles. So as we approach top of climb, one of the things that I will do on, on the uh, YouTube videos that I record, I record in the morning, so it's first thing in the morning, it literally is first cup of coffee time. So what I usually do is after we get to our top of climb here, which is 38,000 feet, which is 32 miles away and should happen at 1417 Zulu. It is 1414 Zulu. Is I will usually hit pause on the recording. You should hit pause in the recording too if you're flying along with me. And what you can do is when you see this is gonna change over to top of uh, descent. So you'll get top of descent information about 100 miles, 90, 75 to 100 miles. That's when I'm gonna start the recording again so that you just don't have to sit and listen to me doing a bunch of mindless chit chat. And I get to actually go and get breakfast so that it will actually be, uh, it's, it's, it's time for food. So if you were a United passenger, I would be going and getting my Stroop waffle now. Which, if you're missing the uh, missing the world of, of of flying, you know you you could actually go and get Stroop waffles on uh, at Amazon. If you are flying one of the other airlines, I'm sure that you could get a con you, you can figure out you know what the brand of pretzels is, and you can get a jar of, of 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 pretzels made by the same manufacturer that's on your favorite airline, and you can give yourself you know you can have you know, your, your, uh, the snacks that they're serving. Again, you, you know, I'm a little bit sort of like, you know, I haven't been in an airplane in a long time. So we're heading 252 with a 78 knot quartering crosswind. So that's why we're uh, a little bit crabby going into this. There's 35,000 feet. Our fuel is in a in perfect shape. It has gone down though. Now you can see where uh, 11,000 pounds is our estimated fuel on arrival. The flight plan says if we go below 7.7 .7 with the number that's over here, 7.7 .7 is when we have invaded our, uh, our alternate fuel and our reserve fuel. And we're not supposed to do that unless we get a diversion or we have to hold or we have to turn 20 degrees for spacing. Once you turn 20 degrees for spacing, then you're starting to use a little bit of your root reserve fuel. And, 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 and the reserve police aren't going to come breaking down your door. Boy, I understand that you've been using too much fuel. We're gonna have to take you downtown for questioning, son. I do that a little bit too well. So here we are, looking out here, there is scenery ahead. This is all ortho scenery. We're uh, coming into New York City. And I'm gonna say 38, 35, 38,000 feet, you can make X-Plane look very good. The clouds that I'm using, the uh, uh, Active Sky comes with clouds. There's two sets. You can have high quality clouds or performance clouds. These are the performance clouds. I don't need anything else. This works great. And then you just come out here out of the clouds and the sim just brightens up so nice. So if they would if they would if they would tone down the dingy just a little bit, that would probably be good. Okay, we're coming up on thirty-eight thousand feet. And the airplane levels off. And it should have shifted us over to Econ Cruise. Yep, we're in cruise mode. And you can also see that it's also estimating our time to top of descent. 
So there really isn't time for me to go and do a nice full breakfast or anything like that. This is a short flight, but I'm going to do the pause button like I was saying. So uh, let's go outside and take a look at the airplane. And I will look for you at 75 miles from top of descent. Happy flying. Hey, welcome back. Like I said, you really can make X-Plane look really, really good. And when you've got really cool airplanes like this one, it really does show some of the value here. How about that? What a cool airplane. Let's see where we are. We are huh, 78 miles. I missed it by three miles. So welcome back and thanks for coming on in. It's time for us to start getting ready. Let's start doing a couple of things that I usually do. And first things first, let's go to the internet, of course. Let's uh, get rid of Boston. We're done with Boston. I'm gonna refresh the digital ATIS for Dulles. And did, uh, Dulles is doing information Lima right now. The wind's 290 at three knots, 10 miles visibility, 29 degrees. The altimeter 3008 should be 3007 for the spy flight, but I'm not gonna whine. Still landing on runway 19 right, left, and center, so we are good to go there. One of the things that I've done here is uh, I am using TopCat. Again, this is an advanced flight planner, and we can come on in here and take a look at some stuff. So let's go over here and hit the update button here, and there we're on the landing page now. There is that weather information that we just read for Washington Dulles. Let's go on down here, and now I'm going to go, and because this is connected to the... Um, Landing weight, we're gonna go ahead and get the landing weight. There it is. And let's hit the compute button. So let's see, what do we got going on here? Reference speed and approach speed. So we're gonna be approaching at 128, our best approach. And our landing distance should be, for the runway that we're planning, 19 left. We should need almost 5,000 feet to land. And we're gonna have 654 feet. And that's with, um, uh, lighting mode is going to be manual, auto brakes are going to be auto 3, packs will be on, and a flaps 30 landing. Okay, so we're going to be able to make this landing pretty good. We can make ourselves a landing report. Once again, you can get the uh, weather. You can also get uh, the uh, data if you wanted to for the other 1.9s. I think that all of this is pretty cool, so let's just hit generate and see what we get out of TopCat. And there is all of that information. So it gives you VREF, VAP speeds, all of this information is perfect for a flaps 30 landing. So you can copy and paste this, so we can put landing information in, and there is a ton of other information that's available here. And the cool part is, is we could use TopCat uh, with the 737-700, which is something I'm looking forward uh, to doing. Fact is, that's probably gonna be what uh, I'm gonna do uh, this afternoon is try and adapt, uh, look at TopCat and see how it uh, works in Microsoft Flight Simulator with the, uh, the PMDG 737. We're doing our turn over here and let's see, do we have a top of descent? So I've got about a 40 mile range, we are 60 miles from top of descent. We do have the latest weather information aboard the airplane, time to brief the approach. 
And first of all, I don't think we need to go back to uh, Boston, so we're gonna clear out those charts. We're gonna clear out information that's a little bit of clutter here. So on the hyper eight arrival, we are coming on down here and I think we're coming in via Albany. No, we're coming in via Barnes. So here's the route via Barnes, 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 Barnes. And this is gonna pick us up at the Lancaster VOR. And then at Lancaster, we'll pick this up. There's Hyper, okay, Hyper, we need to be at 10,000 feet, 250 knots. And then after Hyper for Daddy, we wanna be above 3,000 feet. Okay. So this is a pretty smart airplane. We're cleared to descend via the hyper arrival. So I'm gonna go ahead and put 10,000 feet in here. The airplane will start descending at top of descent. Airbus wants you to push a button. This airplane, if you got the flight management computer program correctly, and the altitude in the altitude window here, this airplane is gonna start you down at 10,000 feet. So I usually will not change this number if I'm on VATSIM, I only change this number when VATSIM controllers will get online and they would say something like United 441, cleared to descend via the Hyper, Hyper 8 arrival, uh, Dulles Landing South. Uh, we actually, they would say clear to descend at pilot's discretion on the Hyper 8 approach, uh, Hyper 8 arrival, Dulles Landing South, okay? That tells me that, okay, I'm good to go for 10,000 feet, which is the last altitude here at Hyper. Now here at Yang, we have 4,000 feet, but we don't have our runway yet. Usually we're not gonna get our runway. Maybe we'll get it, but if it's a busy day in the neighborhood, by having three runways listed here, all the 19s you saw on the ATIS. So what's our landing runways here? 19 left, 19 center, 19 right. Okay, all of those runways are available. That gives them the ability to spread us all out and bring in more airplanes at a big international airport like Dulles. So, we're good at hyper. We don't know which of these transitions we're going to use because we don't know our runway yet. If I were on VATSIM, I would also have charts available for 19 right and also 19 center. That would be my stack of charts, so I'm all ready to go. If, they, if they're gonna make a change, I'm ready for the change. Looking down here, uh, minimums, 200 feet. So this is, uh, we don't put in the barrow here. So you come down here, there is uh, decision height, reference, 200 feet, already set and ready to go. So that's ready. Now, this airplane does need you to put in your ILS. So we're gonna assume that ATC is being very nice to us and saying that we can go ahead and uh, they're gonna tell us our runway right now. So over on the charts, we're gonna be landing on 19 left, so 110.1 with an inbound course of 100, 191 degrees. So 1101, there's 110.1 and then 191 is what we dial in here. If, if ATC pops back in there and tells us that we're gonna go to another runway, we gotta change that. But those are the two numbers that we need to change for this to work. And at this point in time, our preparations for descent are now done. We are about, it looks like 25 miles from top of descent, uh, 32 miles. So, okay, that's the 30 mile, okay, 20 mile range. And you can see, it's kind of hard to see, there's a lot there, but if you zoom on in, there's, I think that's Albany, New York, and there is TD. So top of descent. Now there's 30 miles right there for top of descent. And oh, it says 30 miles right there too. How about that? You get top of descent information two places on the cruise page. You'll also get it over here on the progress page. Uh, fuel has dropped just a little bit. We're at 9.5 as far as our fuel for landing. I think we're not at our optimum flight level. What's our optimum? Uh, optimum is flight level 390, max is 420, we're at 380. So we may be losing a little bit of gas there because we could be a little bit more efficient at the moment. 
but we're well above uh, minimum, so we don't have to worry about that. You can see decision height is now set in here. We've, uh, now we've also got glide slope and localizer information showing up here in the primary flight display because we've dialed that in. If I would go down here and uh, zero this out, see how it all went blank and see how it's gone. So we've uh, activated. So 110.191 one, one is back and there's our information back. How about that? Okay, so everything's looking good here. Depending upon the pilot, uh, sometimes pilots will uh, make their final little announcement and stuff at, right at top of descent. Sometimes they'll usually make it a little bit before. So one of the things that I kind of think is a nice way to do is uh, we'll make our announcement back to the cabin. And information that we're going to have for them is our weather information. So we're gonna have our weather in front of us and turn on the microphone and say, hey folks from the flight deck, uh, we're uh, about 100 miles, uh, about uh, 10, 15 miles away from our top of descent. Uh, we'll be uh, starting our descent into Washington, Dulles. Weather at Dulles is pretty good, good visibility. A uh, little breeze out of the uh, west, not too bad. It is currently, and this is where they're, they'll, they'll do a little math. It's 29 degrees Celsius, and American Airlines is going to tell you it's about 85 degrees at Dulles right now. So, you know, a little fudge factory. They always say it's about. And the only reason that I know that is I've got a little conversion table that I made over here. So I've got my little conversion table. So, you know, it's about 85 degrees. Uh, we'll be landing to the south today. Our uh, arrival gate is going to be Charlie 6. And it does look like we're going to be uh, in the air for just a few more minutes. They'll look down here. So right now the airplane is land saying we'll land at 1503 Zulu. It is 1436, so we'll say we're going to have you on the ground in about half an hour. Certainly want to thank you for flying with us today. And at this point in time, my little arrival announcement will also include, I certainly want to thank you for uh, watching the video today here on YouTube. I'm uh, new here on YouTube, so um, I'm still at the point where I read all the comments and questions. And uh, I certainly appreciate the fact that you're watching, helping me grow this channel just a little bit. At this point, I'll also say you know, thank you to uh, the uh, supporters on Kofi and Patreon. You are the jet fuel for my flight plan, for sure. I'm still a little bit too new uh, on YouTube, so uh, if you'd like to show some extra support, that's what you can do. Or you can come on over and just fly with us on Twitch. Uh, and if you feel like it, drop a sub. Or just come and fly and have a good time. That's, gen that's what the whole point of the spy flight is, is having fun with cool airplanes. And usually as soon as the uh, pilots do their, uh, make their uh, announcement, the flight attendants usually come in and they say, we will be making one more pass through the cabin to, you know, hold out the trash bag. So, and also make sure that seat belts are and we are two miles from top of descent. So, and look at that. Now it's gonna go and start slowing us down. This airplane is also gonna say drag required almost immediately at this point. But drag required usually is gonna go away in about 30 seconds. If, drag st if the drag message stays up, then maybe we need to throw out our um, throw out our speed brakes but you see it's already gone so it just pops that up when it's slowing the plane down and we have started our descent LNAV and VNAV are still active so it's going to follow the constraints down perfectly this is a great airplane to do uh, to take on a VAT on a big VATSIM event because it'll do all the things that you need to do if uh, they give us a speed restriction you know uh, 230 knots on the descent you know, 250 knots or, or greater. You can put that number in here, right there, and it's gonna pop that in for you. So it's really nice. And that's how you do that. Or you can just take control from LNAV and VNAV and control your own speed and your own descent. So it works really, really good. And it's nice and bright outside the window. 
looking outside, you can see we got really, really nice scenery. So that's Ortho. We're uh, in Northern Virginia, I believe now. And look it out through the window. You can even see look it out through the windows looking pretty good. Once you get out of what I call the dull zone, uh, it really does look better. Okay, I think we got, um, okay, I think this line here is two different uh, lines of ortho scenery. So the, it must have been a little bit more cloudy when the satellite took the picture over there. We've briefed the approach. Let's go ahead and I think we can go and do checklist. So let's see, descent checklist, pressurization. It is set to Washington, D.C. It wants us to do another cancel and recall. If the airplane has alerted us to anything, it wants us to see, you know, have we, have we taken care of all of that? Yes. We're gonna go and do auto brakes three on this landing. So that's pretty good. So auto brakes are set. Landing data is our VREF set. So to come over here, now that we've done our descent, go to the init reference page. And there is all of this. We're gonna do a flaps 30 landing. Click that and put that in the window. And that's our landing data. So 124, 122, look over here. This should automatically set our bugs going out. 124 and 122, last two bugs are set. Landing data is good. The approach briefing is done. Let's call the descent checklist clear. And one of the cool things about this electronic flight bag checklist is these two buttons. You see where it says reset? So on the approach, I could reset this particular, or I can hit reset all and it wipes out everything. So if you are doing a second flight from the airport or what I call on the spy flight continuing service, which is, you know, you go and you do a flight the airplane come taxis up to the gate, the passengers get off, they go and pro start preparing the flight, and it goes someplace else. The airplane goes someplace else. And one of the things you can do is if you go and decide to uh, shadow, what I call shadow a real world flight, you can go and see using the end number of your real world airplane where the real world airplane's going next. And you can follow along and uh, follow that airplane. Uh, you could follow the airplane through two or three cycles, uh, two or three flights during the day. And uh, you'd probably be kind of amazed to see where the 737 that's sitting at your hometown airport get ready to do the first flight of the day into the big city, where all that airplane goes each day. So that's kind of a really, you know, sometimes people will say, well, what a, now that you know how to fly the plane, you know, what do you do? Well, the next thing you do is start learning to fly the way the real pilots do. Going, uh, start uh, jumping into rabbit holes with uh, planners like Topcat. Um, and diving in deeper into uh, some of the things that you'll get in the electronic flight bags um, in, the, in the Phoenix and, uh, and soon uh, into the PMDG. Fact is, that's kind of what I'm looking forward to doing today is, um, you know, going and uh, planning a flight with the PMDG 737-700 and I'm gonna use Topcat for my speeds and see how all that works. If you'd like to see that flight, uh, that might be a great comment to make in the uh, comments section here on YouTube or come on over to the spy flight and tell me. He says, yeah, what finally happened with that? You know, if that's the kind of rabbit hole that you might be interested in. Airlines have different policies and stuff. Um, I don't know what United's is. My general policy as a SIM captain is around 25,000 feet. That's when I start thinking about turning on the seatbelt sign. Now, real, did you see uh, another tangent here? Did you see the, the, the clouds flash, you know, and change? That's the weather update, which is, you know, please, 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 developers, there's gotta be a way to make weather not do that. I don't know what the answer is, and that's probably a really, really big developer wish, but it would sure be nice. Okay, everything's looking good here. And I totally forgot what it was that I was yammering about. Let's see, what was, I just, uh, okay, I've, it, it's, it's gone poof. Clearly I need more coffee.
if you remember, I, I could go and rewind the videotape, but I'd have to, the, the recording and stop, but that would just be awkward. So I hope it wasn't too important. Nothing really to change here. Okay, here's an awkward thing for me on this older airplane. Okay, and this is the way the airplane works. Okay, this is not a bug. This is not a problem. You see over here on the radio, you got the transfer switch and two big knobs. So let's say we are talking on 122.8. So there's 122.8. Center then comes online at 1190 and we got to talk to them. So you just transfer. See the lights on over here? Transfer this one. And now we're talking to center. Well, a lot of the other modern airplanes have one knob. This is your active frequency. This is your next frequency, your standby or whatever. This one, it's back and forth. I've gotten myself into a little bit of a little bit of a rabbit hole, you know, trying to go back and forth on that one. And I've tuned out in and out of the wrong frequencies a few times. So that's just one of the charming, charming things about this airplane. Uh, and the uh, the back and forth versus active versus standby radios. We're passing 24,000 feet. Oh, were we talking about seatbelts? Yeah. So unless there's uh, um, unless there's uh, turbulence. Now you could use the uh, auto button too and just forget it. I want to push buttons and stuff. So seatbelts are now going on. And here is our turn. And so update this one again. You might have noticed that in the uh, checklist and all, I've, we've got our auto brakes set. I have not armed speed brakes. So at this point in the flight on our descent, we might need the speed brakes if they all of a sudden say, uh, give us your maximum rate of descent or something because something changed. So you might still need your speed brakes. So I arm the speed brakes later, later in the descent process. You can keep doing that, but I generally don't. The, uh, if, if you look over here and check out the, um, the uh, flap levers, so flap levers and speed brakes, and if you're using the Thrustmaster uh, Airbus controllers like I am, well, we got flaps one, five, 15, 20, 25. Well, the Airbus thing has detents for flaps one, two, three, and four. That's it. Uh, so the detents don't work. I don't use the flap lever with uh, uh, on the Airbus TCA officers with the Boeings, but the speed brake lever works really well. You'll still have to click it to arm it on both this and say the PMDG, but the speed brake lever works really good. And for you on approach, you got to throw out the speed brakes or something like that. There is a thing that the real world pilots do, and that is on approach when you have to use speed brakes and stuff, if at all possible, leave your hand on the speed brake knob lever because you will possibly forget that your speed brakes are out on approach, and that's going to cause all sorts of trouble down the road. So uh, some real world pilots will say, keep your hand on the speed brake lever while it's out, unless you absolutely, you know, have to scratch your nose, but um, keep your hand on there so you don't forget to put the speed brakes back down uh, on approach. And I have done that. I have totally forgotten that I've had my speed brakes out and all of a sudden it's time to go on final and the speeds don't look right, the airplane's behaving a little funny, and you know, oh, the speed brakes. So that, that rule works pretty good for me. Current time, it is 1448 Zulu. We're flying real world time. Over here, the latest ATIS came out at 1352. 1448, we're getting close to a weather change. So we're going to come over here and it's currently Information Lima. It's still Information Lima, but there could be a weather change on the arrival. So this is also if you're on approach every now and then, uh, the controller is going to come on and say, attention all aircraft, uh, Dulles information, uh, Foxtrot is now current, altimeter 2992. 
that's the weather change and that's where even if the ATIS says 3008 you use the current temperature so that's how that works so we're heading 252 252 we're coming on in there's been okay here's hyper and at hyper we're going to be at 10,000 feet as we're up 18 7 18,000 feet altimeter 3008 so 3008 oh this will probably be a good experiment so 3008 Ah, now you see we have altitudes disagree. So when we were coming out, we were looking for, hey, your altimeters aren't right. Now watch what happens when you click the screw. Ah, see, it's good. But you do have to set your backup. 3008. So we did good. All right, so this is good. 10,000 feet. At this point in time, we're going to start getting a clue from controllers. They're going to start making our runway assignment. So at this point in time, ATC is going to say expect uh, ILS runway 19 left. Okay, thanks, runway 19 left. They might also give us a continued descent here at, uh, at uh, Hyper. Quick reminder on the approach. We'll also have a look over at the approach. Hyper 8, what do we have? 250 knots and 10,000 feet at Hyper. After Hyper... We want to be at 4,000 feet at Yang. So after Hyper, they might tell us to descend and maintain 4,000. Or they might just say, uh, United 441, continue the descent to 4,000. You know, descend and maintain 4,000. They probably wouldn't say continue. So let's go ahead and do that as we approach that. So I'm going to put in 4,000. Now, I think that they would step us down a little bit more based on how much traffic there is, but there you go. Map is starting to get a little bit cluttered up. There's our approach. So we're gonna come over here and I'm gonna go to 20 miles on the map. This is also gonna be better for us as we get as we start to come into an increased traffic area on VATSIM. Uh, the TCAS is gonna be good. We're gonna be able to see other traffic around us an awful lot better. So that's a good thing to do too. Altimeters are checked and set. Fact is, I bet we could do approach checklist. And altimeters are set. Nav aids are set. Approach checklist is done. Next is landing checklist. How about that? Almost like we know what we're doing. Speed brakes down auto brakes are set not much else to worry about and look at that we get to see a little more scenery and i'm going to tell you from what are we at 12 15,000 feet that's not bad scenery at all and so with the really awesome airplanes that are available for x plane uh, and and it takes a bunch of extra work and it's never going to look as good as Microsoft Flight Simulator but I will tell you uh, you can make it look really good and that's why it is that you know over on the live stream we'll, we'll, we'll get in the you know X-Plane versus MSFS uh, debate not debate but you know it's like pineapple and pizza it's a big deal uh, to some people out there um it's why it is that I'm not counting uh, X-Plane out of the equation yet. Can't wait to see what they do and with really awesome airplanes. That being said, I will tell you that there are things at Microsoft, the visuals are great. They make multiplayer a breeze. So you can go with your friend uh, from halfway around the world and you can go and do a, uh, an airplane flight with your friend halfway around the world. I got one of the best flight sim experiences slash tours I've ever gotten. I have a friend who uh, lives in Greece and I got a, an airplane tour over simulated Greece on flight sim and uh, you know she was saying this is this, this is that, this is so cool. And, uh, you know, so that is that is where Microsoft Flight Simulator just goes, you know, blows everybody out of the water. 
Okay, the FMC wants uh, speed brakes out. We're, we're slowing down pretty good. I don't, you know, I think that maybe the speed brake command is a little bit, you know, the speed brake notification is might be a little bit oversensitive on this airplane. So unless I'm not slowing down, I generally don't do anything with that. Approaching 10,000 feet, we're gonna go ahead and do landing lights. We're gonna preload that nose light and I'm gonna also ring the bell. You ring the bell on this airplane with the no smoking light, which in most modern Boeing jetliners, since smoking's prohibited on airplanes, they've gone and, you know, replaced the no smoking light with the Wi-Fi light uh, that, you know, automatically goes on and off. But for the pilots, this is just, this is just a ring the bell. Let's see, we should have locked the uh, cockpit door after our little tour. And we're coming on in. Reset this. There we go, 221. And we are continuing our descent. So we have to be at 5,000 feet at Oogle. Ogle, Oogle, I guess. So we're going to easily make 5,000 feet. We're going to be doing pretty good at Liddy and Yang. And by that time, we should start to pick up the ILS. Let's go ahead and remind ourselves the airplane says landing speeds 122. Of course, I always add a little bit to that. So it says 122. I'm going to add some. I also get to be a little bit of a control freak about now. And usually uh, by now, air, uh, air traffic control is telling us to maintain certain speeds. So I might go ahead and go to vertical speed so that I can go to, usually they're telling us about 210 knots. And then I will use my vertical speed to make sure that I hit that 4,000 feet at Liddy. You can see the, uh, the little banana line here. So that's how it is that I will do that. Now, you notice I did go to 210 knots, but we're not slowing down. So now might be a great opportunity to do speed brakes. So there's some speed brake. And you did not go to 210 knots. Oh yeah, that's right. I had to hit the speed button. It's not just enough to do vertical speed and hit that and dial it. You also have to hit speed. So let's try it again. Speed brakes going out. And now we're slowing down. We'll be below 5,000 feet at Oogle. So we're not going to break that speed, uh, that speed, speed restriction. One of the things that happens is when you pull the speed brakes out, uh, it, it tends to mess with your views. So the speed brake animation in this airplane really does tend to mess up the views. So we can go back here and we can watch the speed brakes go up. But when you try to look here, it sometimes just doesn't work well for you. See, that view that I did there was supposed to be look down at your uh, airspeed indicator in the, and, and a tight view on the map. So that kind of messes with this in this airplane. Looks like we're going to need a little bit more speed brake here. There's 229. I've got glide slope and localizer showing up in the ILS now. There's 220. That's probably pretty good at the moment. So let's put them away and have a look. Okay, so we're at 220 knots. I was just trying to show you, one of the best things to do is look over on the, look up here for placarded speeds for flaps. And I can't find the placard. I usually will go maybe flaps one at this point. That's going to help me keep a little bit of control of my speed as we go on down. So there's glide slope over there. Hmm, localizer isn't indicated. It says we're 20 miles out. 
And the speed appears to be picking up just a bit. So let's uh, decrease our rate of descent since we're in good shape. We're, we're right where we're supposed to be. That helps our speed go down. Good airplane. Now about now they're probably gonna start giving us our final uh, approach uh, instructions. And so at this point in time, they're gonna probably tell us 180 knots till about five miles from the airport. And that's usually the final checkpoint before landing. And so they're probably gonna say 180 knots or greater at Tel Domsey. So let's go down here and do 180 knots because they're gonna start doing that. And that's gonna give us an opportunity for some more flaps. We're also gonna go ahead and do landing gear and flaps five. I think I'm done with speed brakes at this point in time. So on this airplane, you put your clicker over here. Our speed brakes are now armed for landing. I'm going to go ahead and set my heading bug again to move us uh, so we're right ahead of us in case we got to go. And you know what we can do now. Landing checklist. Cabin is secured. Speed brakes are armed. Gear is down. Flaps are not completely set. But you know what? Landing checklist is done. We're ready to land. We are now 180 knots. So I've got flaps are out at five at the moment. We've got glide slope and localizer. At uh, this point in time, I'm going to hit the approach button. I use the approach button an awful lot. We are in a one person cockpit. This is where workload is the highest. It is no shame to use the approach button. Absolutely no shame at all. Okay, we're, we're making a weird turn. We're making a weird turn here. So what happened is I'm too far away from the localizer and it's a little upset with me. I made the turn and I think I was a little bit too far out. So, you know, we, we, we're, we're correcting it as quick as we can. So maybe wait until we get a little bit closer because it was trying to do a bunch of other stuff. We're still above glide slope, so we've saved the situation. Now let's go ahead and turn this a little bit more. Sometimes that happens. Let's go ahead and get this thing centered back up. 19 miles, this is probably a little bit better for us. So it was currently doing something else. Okay, here comes the localizer again. Let's see if it'll snag it this time and not go uh, crazy. Localizer is armed. Glide slope is set. Glide slope is armed. Localizer, it's capturing. So I probably hit that button a little bit too soon. Checklists are good. One of the things we do over on uh, Twitch is the uh, people that are watching can say, do posture check, stretch. Posture check is really a good idea in the world of flight simming because if you're on a long flight, you move around in your chair, but now you gotta be seated correctly. You gotta be able to get to your uh, flight controls. So we'll go ahead, it's setting us up there. We are at 4,000 feet. Everything's looking good. Some of the last things that I will do is I will come over here and uh, if we're good on the approach, which we are, I'm gonna go over here and now click the airport button. And I'm gonna go ahead and move this over to where we're going to be going. So Kila 7, we're gonna go back on Kila, there's our gate. So I have that set over there and it's all ready to go. The other thing I'll do is I will look up at um, the, um, the communications client, uh, V-Pilot or X-Pilot and see if ground so by now we're getting kicked over to tower. If there's ground, I wanna set that in my standby frequency because we're really busy at that point in time. And when you're doing several other things, that's usually when tower says, exit right when able, contact ground. Hey, I, I have time, There's that's the co-pilot supposed to do that. So pre-setting ground really helps you out. Final check over here, we're gonna go 10 miles. And there's Domsey, so 180 knots or greater until Domsey. Then our final approach speed, 122. I always add a little bit to that, so we're gonna redo the speed to 125. 
and we're now capturing glide slope. Airplanes coming down. And as usual, we get closer to the ground and the haze and probably the air pollution and being under the clouds kicks in and we're back to, you know, super gray, which is not fun. Okay, we're doing good there. Five miles to Domsey. Sometimes what the airplane, what the controllers will say, contact tower at Domsey. Or maybe contact tower 10 miles or something like that. That's been known to happen. There's 194. Another thing you can do is if you've got time, I should have briefed my missed approach. Missed approach. Uh, climb to 800 feet. Left turn and hold at RML. Uh, we were on a VATSIM event yesterday, and our VATSIM event yesterday was at Princess Juliana Airport, and they were doing go-arounds, and they were doing missed approaches. I'm starting to see some runway lights show up here, but again, it's gray and dingy, so it's hard to see. So until I can clearly see my runway, I usually let the autopilot do its thing. When I can clearly see the runway, then hey, I'm all for taking off the autopilot. But not till, not till I can see something more than just this one little speck that's right above my pointer. Okay, we are coming up on Domsey. That's five miles from the runway. 125 knots is our final approach speed. So speed's coming down to 125, and we're going to roll out the rest of our flaps. Flaps 15. Speed's rolling it down. Speed's coming down a little more. Flaps 20. There goes our flaps out. In the sunshine, the flaps on this airplane look great. 1,000. Another notch of flaps. It is really forgiving. I'm probably rolling them out just a little bit fast right now. But we're sim pilots and I'm gonna be busy. So I try and get these set. Sitting back in my chair, making sure it doesn't uh, lean back. We're established on our speed, flaps out. I got three green at this point in time. I'm gonna, the last thing I do is look at the wind indicator. Winds are ahead and to the right at five knots. I see the runway, I can see it clearly now. Autopilot goes off, click it twice to silence the alarm. We're gonna get ready to go and do auto throttles. But mostly I'm gonna go and keep my auto throttles on until almost before touchdown. Looking at the Pappy lights, we're getting a little high over the parking lot. That's gotta be a great plane spotter Minimums. parking lot. Minimums, landing. If we were in an Airbus, we would have said continue. And see, now all of a sudden the, the sky's cleared 100. up and look at how nice this looks. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Reversers. Reversers are yellow, green. That took a little long. Fifty knots. Stow the reversers. Man auto brakes off. Manual braking, and as expected, we're catching the Kila Seven. High speed. A little more manual braking. Looking outside, speed brakes are still up. Usually, I don't see speed brakes going down on a real jet until we're uh, doing the uh, doing the turn. Now, in this case, if you've got a speed brake lever, all you need to do is move it down one 
and up one, and that'll drop your speed brakes. Off the runway, landing lights. Strobes. More braking. And turn around, reach over. And I have my flaps set on a button, so I just push it about five times and that takes gets the flaps up. Then look over here, do our nice turn. And we're going down on the Kila Taxiway. Yes, I know it's Kilo Taxiway. Uh, one of the main moderators on the spy flight over on Twitch is named Kila, so we've replaced Kilo with Kila. Okay, we can also come down here. We can turn off auto brakes, and we're going to go ahead and turn up the APU, add a little bit of power to get our taxi, and I'm also using the ground map with the moving map. And I generally do this with every airport, even if it's one I'm confi uh, you know, familiar with, because tower might say, you know, ground control, uh, uh, left turn at hotel and taxi in on Juliet. Uh -huh, whoa, 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 what was that? And that's just, it's right there for me. So I think that that really helps out. APU is coming on up, so that's good. Adding a little bit of power. Everything's cleaned up up here. We got nose gear set up. We've got the lights off. Nothing really to do except concentrate on our taxi. And that's one of the things I really like about this airplane is it's so easy uh, to uh, you know, get cleaned up after landing. Let's see, we can go and turn the auto throttle off. We could also turn off the flight directors. And probably going just a little bit too fast here. So we're looking for the Echo Taxiway. That is one, two, third available left. As we come on into the Washington DC airport, this is a payware airport. It is a particularly nice payware. If we wanted to be good pilots at this point, we would go down to altitude off, which I believe in uh, the other airplanes uh, is called transponder in the uh, PMDG. So we've stopped altitude reporting, but we should still be showing up on their screens. But generally, once ground says, uh, you know, uh, taxi, you know, you know, taxi to you know, ramp via uh, via Kila, at that point in time, it's sort of like we'll start getting that cleaned up and ready to go. We can come down here and go to the status page. Status is showing the brake temperatures. My brake temperatures are zero. And we are coming up on the Echo, Echo Taxiway. We're going to Charlie 6. So that's going to be because this is a long airplane, airplane. They've got some angled parking coming in up here. So down to about what? There's a little less than 10 knots at a touch of power as we go around the turn. Continue around, maybe a little more than a touch of power. One of the buttons that I have set up on the uh, side stick um, is the button that's on the back of the Airbus side stick. And that way that returns me to what I call the captain's view. And the captain's view is looking forward and that way I can get to it very easy. Charlie 6 is one, two, three gates down. One, two, so this is where they're gonna put the 787s and the 777s. So there's uh, Charlie 2, that's gonna be Charlie 4, and this is ours. I think that Charlie 4 is, is a short, is a small, shorter gate. Oh, and it just got uh, dingy again. And so we're going, there's ours. In the real airport, this is at an angle. This one looks like it's straight on, but I think we'll be fine. Throttle it down just a little more. There's Charlie 4. Start a gentle turn. Charlie 6, there we go. The reason that I chose Charlie 6 is over on FlightAware. 
FlightAware showed uh, showed me that the flight from uh, da uh, Boston that day uh, was coming in here. You saw I just turned off the nose light. Uh, somebody that watches and flies with us over on Twitch uh, is a uh, professional airplane wrangler. They they do uh, they do uh, bring in airplanes, and they said, "Would you please, 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 would you please, please, please stop blinding us?" And there we go. Parking brakes. Parking brakes are up. The APU is already up. The generator is up. So we can go ahead and come on down here and do engines. Transponder goes off. Beacon goes off. Let's go ahead and we're going to turn on the isolation valve. Let's do seat belts. Passengers want to get up. Let's go over here, disarm the emergency exit lights. So those are good too. We will turn off the uh, fuel pumps over here. Fuel pumps are going off. Everything looks good here. Lights are good. All of this is great. Now then, if we look over here, some airports, this is one of the airports that has good smart gates and you can see a jetway is already in place at the L1. The door is not open though on this airplane. So we have to come down and go to the iPad. Now this is one of the things that's cool. We can come back here and the iPad stays up and you can come over here and go to ground. No, we don't go to ground. We go to the airplane and we can go and open the L1. And we can also open the cargo bays and you see your jetway right there. Go to ground. We need chocks in place. We need the LSUs, the loader units. We're gonna need a ground power unit. We're gonna need the AC unit and that's pretty good. And then with all of those in place, you can go load and unload and the airplane is unloading. Outside the plane. So there is our uh, nice airplane. It's unloading. We're doing really good. Like I said, this is a very, very nice version of Dulles. It really is. So this is a commuter uh, part. So this is a great place. Uh, this is the part of the airport for CRJ operations. Really good for CRJs. If you're uh, flying the new CRJ um, uh, over in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And then here is the absolutely iconic terminal. And not quite as cool, but I think you can also go into this terminal and uh, this, I, I think, they, they, they started to do a little bit of modeling uh, when this came out of terminals. Of course, now uh, they're modeling full terminals over in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And I think that there's a new Dulles, and I think it looks absolutely stunning. So here's some of the older gates here. I don't know if they do the uh, Bravo concourse. I've had a couple of layovers at this airport, and I've got to go and do some... Uh, do some Oh, look at this. They did a really nice job of this concourse, too. They don't have the, uh, the, the trucks going back and forth. And I don't know if they did anything with this one. Uh, oh, look at this. They did this one, too. So let's go a little bit slower here. And that's I, I think the way you do this one is it, the, you kind of zigzag back and forth in this terminal. Ah, there's guy on the phone guy on the phone. So there's duty free, there's booze. I mean, I know it's more than booze. Is there a Starbucks down? There's got to be a Starbucks. There's a jeweling jeweler shop. And um, Michael, there's a leather shop, motion shop. Uh, I guess that's br breaking something like that. But again, you get the picture. You can go and do some cool things. You can, you, you can actually walk through, and I think the new Boston Airport for Microsoft Flight Simulator, they're starting to even model the jetways. So if you're like me and you haven't had an opportunity to go and uh, do uh, a flight in a very long time, you can actually go and get your AvGeek fix on that way. But we did it. I hope you enjoyed this, air, this flight. Uh, this is an amazing airplane, Flight Factor still absolutely set the standard.
with this particular airplane. I really think they did. And the cool part for us uh, in Microsoft Flight Simulator is there is a developer that is working on a 757 and I can't wait to see what they do with that. As I always like to say with my YouTube videos, this is not specifically about the right way versus the wrong way. This is what it is that I've found that works for me. Um, I'm still new on YouTube. I do read all the questions, comments. Can't wait to see what you think about this. I uh, hope you'll join us over on the Spy Flights on Twitch. Uh, Tuesday through Sunday is when we're flying right now. And that's at 1900 Zulu uh, during the summer. That is 3 p.m. Eastern time in the uh, United States. I hope you are doing well. I will look forward to seeing you again soon here on YouTube and even sooner probably on Twitch. Uh, as I always like to say, though, because we're still dealing with viruses and stuff, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you in the friendly skies.